Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your Aura Weekly City Seminar Series. Uh, today we're very fortunate to be joined by Keith Devlin, who's come down to us from uh, Stanford University. Uh, Keith uh, did his bachelor's in mathematics at the King's College in London, uh, and did his PhD at, in math at uh, the University of Bristol. Uh, and uh, he is now uh, executive director of uh, the HDAR Institute and also co-founder and an executive committee member of the uh, Media X uh, uh, Institute. He uh, has been uh, for uh, quite some time a senior researcher at the Center for Study and Language and Information Studies at Stanford. Uh, Keith is a uh, fellow of the World Economic Forum uh, and a fellow of the uh, AAAS and chair of the math section of AAAS. He's uh, also known as the Math Guy on NPR's Weekend Edition. You may have heard him on the radio. Uh, he is the author of uh, over 80 research papers in mathematics and science in general, uh, and uh, 31 books. Some of you may have read them. Uh, they include six research books, seven textbooks, and 16 books for the general public. In 2007, Keith was uh, awarded the Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization. Uh, and we're going to uh, hear a talk today that is deeply connected to Carl Sagan uh, and uh, in to do with uh, contact with ET. Uh, so if you'll join me in welcoming Keith. Thank you. Okay, so um, we all remember the clip and we remember the message that came. <laughs> all right, all right, it's restarting. Wait a minute, wait a minute, those are numbers. That was a three, the one before it was a two. Um, base 10 numbers, just start counting now, see how far we can get. One. Seven. 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 Two primes. Two, three, five, seven, those are all prime numbers. And there's no way it's a natural phenomenon. Holy oh, shit. Okay, let's just calm down and build a star pile. It doesn't make any sense. The system is too young, so it can't have a planet. Let alone Okay, so we know this is Hollywood because she stops at seven. Right? A real physicist would make sure nine didn't appear and eleven did, and then would break out the champagne. A mathematician would go to nineteen. But we've got, if we get to nineteen, we're all sold on it. Um, so it's a very seductive thesis, um, but is it totally reliable? For sure. um, my view is the only potential candidate for an universal language is going to be mathematics, and it's going to be things like prime numbers. But is that going to guarantee that if we receive a signal and then we can figure something out, are we going to have a basis for communication? Well. Um, it sort of depends upon this view of the universe and our way of understanding the universe encapsulated by uh, the founder of modern science, Galileo's phrase about the language in which the universe is written being mathematics and uh, that if we want to understand the universe then that's the language in which we want to do it. And that sort of leads us to assume that if it is the native language of the universe then any intelligent life in the universe is going to be tuned into that language and therefore we do have a basis for communication. Okay. So it's a pretty seductive thesis. But I'm going to argue um, that it's not self-evidently true. There are reasons that we, want, we doubt this. Uh, okay. And that depends on a, on a more human-centric evolutionary view of how did we come to be where we are and how did we come to develop our mathematics. Now it's certainly the case that when anyone does mathematics, I've done mathematics pretty well all my adult life, the moment I sit down and start to do, think mathematically, I have this incredible platonic sense of discovery of a world that's waiting to be discovered. But as I've got older and I think wiser, I've thought, well, maybe that's just delusionary. 
um, because I'm actually locked into this brain that's thinking this anyway, um, is it necessarily the case? And a few years ago, I actually, start, back in the mid-90s, early 90s, started asking the question, how did this human brain acquire the capacity to do mathematics? And what did it do when it acquired that capacity? And that's an interesting question, because you know, numbers are about 10,000 years ago. Um, you know, counting was, is, is somewhat older, 30,000, 40,000 years, but we were counting for a long time with just one one correspondences with, with notches and so forth. Abstract numbers we think were discovered or invented, whichever you want to call it, about 10,000 years ago in some area, essentially to create money. Um, numbers we think were invented, uh, or they, they grew out of the desire to have tokens for ownership and for barter and trade, so you need money, you need numbers. Numbers and money are two sides of the same coin, to use a, an obvious metaphor. Um, so. It, 10,000 years, then we've got sort of recognizable mathematics, two to 3,000 years old. Um, most mathematics, uh, well, most mathematics within the last decade, within the last century, um, but the mathematics of science, most of it since the 16th, 17th century. So mathematics is recent. It's very recent stuff. Um, and in, in terms of the evolution of the human species, that mathematics has been done in a brain that's been essentially the same since the Stone Age. Now, it's a plastic organ, so we've got to be a little bit careful about how we interpret that. But as, but as an organ, it, is, it, it's, it, it hasn't going to have changed that much uh, in the time span of mathematics. So mathematics has to be, at least my argument, and I, I published a book in 2000 called The Math Gene, which puts forward this thesis. The argument was that, in the words of Stephen Jay Gould, mathematics is an exaptation of capacities that were put into the human brain mental pool, the, the, the gene pool uh, for, de for developing brain structure uh, in order to meet or to give us an advantage or a survival edge uh, for fairly important survival uh, challenges in, in, in the world. Okay, so we, we look, take the natural selection view and say what, what, what did our ancestors face that would have required, or that, that, that would have, where there would have been advantage, you've got to be careful how you say these things, that there would have been an advantage, a selection advantage, to have a certain capacity. What are they, and then eventually, how did they come to be exapted and mixed together to give us the capacity for mathematical thought? By the way, the hopeful, one hopeful conclusion out of this is that um, mathematics is nothing special. If it's in the gene pool, then everybody except for a small group of people born with, with, with unfortunate brain structure, or fortunate, whichever way you want to look at it, I guess, uh, are incapable of doing mathematics. But, but mathematics, because some of us can do it, all of us pretty well can do it. Um, you know, if you're born with two functioning legs, in principle, you can run a marathon. And in the, in the 70s and 80s, many of us discovered that regularly ordinary people could run marathons. It didn't look pretty, and it didn't, we weren't very fast at it, but we could do it. It was a spectrum. And I don't think there's mathematics is any different from a spectrum. You're on the spectrum. The only question is how far do you want to exercise that organ and develop it? Okay. So mathematics developed out of capacities or was created out of capacities that evolved, that, that got into the gene pool to give us a survival edge. Well, when you follow that line of thinking through, then you get this at least a suspicion at the beginning that that mathematics is going to be incredibly well tuned to encapsulate and to capture the image of the, of the universe that the human, find, the human mind forms. So what we really, I mean, the, this is where the way the argument's going to go, it's going to be that we are, that mathematics tells us an awful lot about how this organ interacts with that environment. That already assumes that we're regarding the two things as separate, which is, is, is arguable in itself. But I'm going to take a sort of a classic Cartesian approach of us in an environment, and even in that, that approach, with that assumption, what we're capturing is an interaction between this organ and that environment. And then the question would be, is that the only kind of interaction that will produce signals that we might pick up? Okay. Um, so the thesis is going to be, yeah, mathematics tells us an awful lot about a universe. It's the, in, it's the universe we create in our mind in our attempts to understand the universe we're in. Okay. Um, so there were two books came out in 2000. There was the one that I wrote, The Math Gene, 
And by co well, actually, by total coincidence, just a few miles down the road in Berkeley, uh, George Lakoff, uh, together with a colleague, Rafael Nunez, wrote another book, uh, came out actually with the same publisher, bo both books, and they came out within the same year, 2000. And his book was called Where Mathematics Comes From. And theirs, in a sense, took, their, their story begins where mine finished. I sort of told the story of how the capacity for mathematics got into the human gene pool. And they sort of said, well, assuming that the human brain can do mathematics, how can it do mathematics? So they gave a procedural analysis, a cognitive science analysis, of how the brain does, does mathematics. So we've got these two arguments. Um, there's mine, which is that um, the first two bullet points are really mine, which was that mathematics uh, evolved, uh, was exacted from evolutionary evolved traits uh, in the human brain. Um, and and, and that, that's great as mathematics. And then um, Lakoff and Nunez gave a much more detailed discussion of how that mathematics would be done in that embodied mind. Okay. Um, briefly, what I did was I identified nine capacities. These are not independent. There's all sorts of connections between them. But I identified nine capacities for each of which you could tell a pretty good evolutionary story of how it got into the gene pool uh, for various advantages. Some of them are obvious. Some need a little bit more thought. And, uh, and then the, 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 the nub of the argument, or the, bu the bulk of the, the, the argument I put together, was how these came to be fused together and how they give us mathematics. And it, it, I mean, it took a book because there was a, there was a lot of things to explain. Uh, but it was a thesis, and it's a th it's, 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 one of the nice things is this came out in 2000, and, and, and there's been some research since that has at least uh, confirmed, insofar as one has confirmation, uh, some of the... the, the, the this thesis led to various hypotheses, some of which have been tested by educational psychologists. So we've had some confirmation uh, of, of that thesis. But it's a, it's a thesis, uh, as is uh, Lakoff and Nunez's work. Um, and they, as, as anyone will know who's read any of, of Lakoff's work, either in science or, well, or politics or whatever, uh, he's big on metaphors. And, uh, and his view of mathematics, which... I agree with entirely. When I read his book, uh, the overall thesis I thought was absolutely bang on target. I actually disagree with some of the particulars in his book, um, but in principle I, I buy his argument um, that everything is metaphorical, that the, 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 all of mathematics is, is a hierarchy of metaphors that eventually are grounded in real world experiences, that we understand anything new by interpreting that in terms of what we all read. In other words, learning is creating new metaphors that link the new to the old. We interpret in the old, um, but let's be careful that there's an implication there. That means the old is going to colour the new. We only understand the new in terms of the old. We can eventually nuance things and change them, but the, we, we get there by starting from where we already were. And you, you take that right back to the moment you're born. And we can iterate that. And as you iterate it, you can get a, an incredibly rich domain. So you get this tower of metaphors grounded out in the real world. Uh, by the way, their book is about twice as long as mine because they go into incredible detail of an awful lot of specifics of mathematics. I just talk about mathematical capacity in general terms. They go into great detail. It was, it was kind of nice that their book came out because I knew that when my book came out, I would be obliged to write another book that explained the process. And by golly, it appeared. So by the time I went on the talk show service, when... when, when when people said, how does this work? I could simply say, oh, there's another book by Lakoff and Nunez, and that tells you the answers. Um, now, by then, I actually doubted some of their particulars, but it, it got me off the hook. Okay. Um, it should be said that they're not saying that we are conscious about these. They're really talking about how neurons connect and, 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 the, and the brain adapts. Uh, and what they're saying is the way to understand it is that these neural connections form to enable us to interpret the new in terms of the old. So they're not talking about metaphors we are necessarily uh, consciously aware of. They, they get down to the level of... They're looking for a sort of an, Occam, an Occam's razor argument which says that uh, what's the, the least that the brain would have to do to be able to do this new stuff? You know, how, what's the minimal number of connections? What modules could be taken? Uh, what, what thought models, what cognitive modules could be taken to, to provide this. So it's a, it's, an, it's a minimalist argument of how can the brain have done it. Uh, and it, it's very much an Occam's razor argument of let's find the, the simplest 
uh, one that involves, that involves the least assumptions, uh, as was mine. Okay. Um, briefly, this is what they say, is that uh, you begin in the, uh, in the, in the playground, you're, you're mixing sand and, and, and buckets of water and things and objects and counting things and getting things into collections. And then if you live somewhere like Palo Alto, your parents send you to a place where you're met with these kind of things, which are, you know, platonic objects, a bit large, um, and they look much more mathematical than the stuff here. Um, but we've actually already been pushed in a certain way of thinking about things because there's nothing non-mathematical about that. It's just that the mathematics here is easier than the mathematics there. Um, and then a bit later, you learn symbolic expressions, and then you sort of link it back to the world, and then you learn more fancy stuff, and then you get all the way around to things like black holes and graphs and different representations and abstract pure mathematics. So you go through this hierarchy, <coughs> and each time you understand the new in terms of the old. You understand the Palo Alto school stuff in terms of the playground. You understand the numbers on the board in terms of the, of the, of the stuff you learnt in the classroom and so forth. And a lot of educational development work follows this process. So it's a familiar image. If you take that picture and you cash it out in terms of branches of mathematics, you're sort of looking at this. Uh, basic cognition that we're born with. Uh, then by metaphors, you get from that to number and shape. You get to understand number and shape. And then number and shape, when you, sort of, when you make that more abstract, you get arithmetic and geometry. Then when you abstract one step beyond that, numbers are patterns of collections. Algebra deals with patterns of numbers. And so you're just taking, you're iterating the idea of looking at the patterns, one up the hierarchy, and then you iterate higher, you have functions, higher up the hierarchy, and then you have calculus, and then eventually you get to the heavy stuff, which in their case, they give an argument of Euler's identity, e to the i pi is negative one, and they claim to ground that in the playground. Now, I've got to say, somewhere around here, I actually part company with them and say I, I don't believe all their arguments. I think something else is going on here. But the general picture, I think, is, is OK. And in terms of communicating with ET, the, the damage has already been done, already down there, because we're grounded in our childhood experiences and, and, and the limitations of our sensory apparatus. OK. That was their thesis and, and mine. OK. Um, But we are left with this feeling that mathematics is objective, that it's universal, that we would have to have it to understand the world, that in a sense, it is the world. OK. Well, let's see where that might come from. By the way, I notice there's one or two young people here. This is speculation. Right? I mean, you know, this is speculation. An awful lot of stuff in science is speculation. Now, don't assume that everything I'm saying is correct. What I would like you to do is think, Maybe I should think about it. Okay, that's, that's what I think my role is. I, I don't like being called a professor because that suggests you profess something. Uh, a professor is really a questioner. Our job is to, quest, to raise questions and to think about things and to challenge things. Okay, so um, human brain evolved to meet certain kind of, ne of needs. You know. Which tree has the most fruit on it? If we're going to expend energy getting up that tree, let's climb the one with the most fruit. So, Having a sense of quantity is important. It was first of all to negotiate the physical world, and then as life got more complicated, the social world. By the way, part of my book is focusing in on the fact that it was social complexity that led to the abstraction for mathematics. Because when you think about it, what in life requires huge mental capacity to do with complex networks of abstractions? That's social interaction. When our ancestors started to interact and depend on each other, the amount of complexity was huge in abstractions. Ownership, relationships to each other, to, to form societies that depended on each other, to put their trust in others, the brain had to deal with enormous abstractions uh, and complex networks of abstractions. And part of my thesis was it was that socialization of societies that prepared the brain for doing the abstract reasoning that's mathematics. <coughs> There's more to it than that, but that's sort of the, the, the essence of it. Uh, but there's the evolutionary story of how the human brain evolved, and it is a, it's, an, it's a challenging question aside from mathematics, 
because the human brain is enormously expensive in terms of energy consumptions, childhood support, you know, they, they, it doesn't even finish maturing until you know, 10, 15, 20 years after you're born, it takes a long time, you're, he you're helpless for many years. Uh, it's an extremely expensive organ, so the payoff of that human brain has got to be really big uh, to, to make us survive. Okay. Um, it certainly didn't evolve to deal with abstract objects in the sense of sort of mathematical objects. Those, were, those came recently and by then that brain was there. But let's ask ourselves, how is it that the brain was eventually able to deal with abstractions? Well, there's two ways it could do it. Either this brain that evolved to deal with all of these challenges in the world, physical and then social, so there are some abstractions beginning to come in, although there are abstractions embodied in the real world. I, by the way, I sometimes, uh, in, in when I was talking about my book, when it first came out, I used to describe mathematics, uh, I, I used to say a mathematician is someone who approaches, approaches mathematics as a soap opera. And by what, what I meant by that was, people watch soap operas, now the characters in a soap opera by and large, this was true in 2000, it's a little bit less true now, they were completely unrealistic. They lived in beautifully clean houses, they all looked beautiful, they had nice clean clothes and everything, perfect teeth. They were abstractions, and their lives were abstractions, but they were embodied abstractions that were very similar to our own lives. So watching a soap opera wasn't challenging. Okay. Mathematics is also a soap opera, it's just the objects are pure abstractions like numbers and geometric shapes and so forth. They have relationships. It's all about relationships between these abstractions. It's just they're not human relationships. They're arbitrarily defined abstractions. So what makes mathematics difficult is not that you're dealing with relationships between abstractions, because we can do that when we watch a soap opera. It's the fact that you have to create all of that world in your mind before you can start. The cognitive load is huge. There's no cognitive load for a soap opera because they're identifiable with the world we live in. But the abstractions of mathematics are pure abstractions, and so it's, it's, there's an extra cognitive load. Okay, so the question is, how do we, how does the brain deal with these abstractions? Well, one of two things can happen. Either this brain that evolved to deal with the stuff it evolved to deal with is able to apply itself to these pure abstractions, the, these platonic things, if you, if you want to take the, 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 the standard description of the, the objects of mathematics. Or is it going to do what Lakoff and Nunez have been telling us has been happening as we learn mathematics? Namely, we take these abstractions and we interpret them as embodied things in terms of our own human experiences. Now, this is a huge difference. Either the brain is moving into a new domain and we're actually following that domain, or we're interpreting that domain in terms of what's already in here and we're reasoning with that. Okay. And that's going to be hugely important in terms of with math whether mathematics is a guaranteed language for dealing with other intelligences. By which I mean, well, well I'll come back to what I mean by the, the specifics. Okay, so is it A, new neural processes on new objects, or is it old processes on old style representations of new objects? Are we pulling in or are we pushing out? Okay, well... Let's follow it through a little bit. How did the brain begin? I mean, there are lots of creatures around with different kinds of brains, from very simple organisms to things like the human brain. Well, if you look at the evolutionary story about what the brain did, it was, a, it was a mediation between stimulus and response. Okay. Uh, in fact, we've still got some of the early parts of the brain in the amygdala, the, the, the so-called reptilian brain, the things that sort of that, that reacts before you do things. You know, if you if someone threw something towards you, you would sort of duck before you even know what it was because you're programmed to do that. The same way when you're driving a car, if a child runs out from behind a car, you've hit the brake before you're conscious of seeing the child. The amygdala does that and you get a big bolt of, of adrenaline in the process. Um, and only later do you sometimes override it. For example, if, if someone threw a, a coiled rope into the room, instinctively you'd think snake and you'd recoil but you might not quite recoil very far because your neocortex would say, no, it's just a piece of rope, it's not a snake, don't be silly. Um, okay. So we get these mediations. Um, 
And it was all about mediating between input and output. So that's how brains, that's what they came in to do. Uh, and the higher brain functions, are, they act upon the lower brain functions. It's like building hierarchies of software. You know, it's all on the simpler and simpler levels. And so when you think of how the brains, our brains and the other brains evolved and what they were purpose, what they were doing in terms of our survival, and then you sort of apply Occam's razor to this, the most likely explanation, the simplest explanation of how we acquired this capacity to deal with other stuff was that we are simply taking what the brain does and rigging it so that it does the new thing. A couple of examples. That does not tell the time. I can use that to tell the time, but that's just a piece of physics. It's just doing stuff. Right? We build this so that when it does its physics stuff, I interpret that as telling the time. I've got a computer here, which is not doing mathematics or, or language. It's doing, well, it's, it's routing electrons. Well, it's not even doing that. Brian Greene was telling us there's no such thing as electrons. Stuff is happening in there. Um, but because Apple are really smart people, when it does its physics stuff that we don't really understand, except in terms of models that we create, like electrons and all that kind of stuff, when it's doing its stuff, we, because of the way we built it, can interpret that as word processing or calculating or whatever. And we've got this thing here that evolved to do certain things in the world. And so it gives us a sense that it's doing things. OK. So the most simple explanation of how we acquire these new capacities is that we're running the stuff, and we are simply rigging it so that the interface between what's going on and what's going on out there meets our needs, as we do with computers, watches, and everything else. But, but if you think about that for a minute, by the way, I'm, I'm focusing on this little sub thing because this is really getting at why we are seduced by thinking that mathematics is objective because that's part of the thesis as well. Why, do, well. why is it that we are easily seduced into thinking that mathematics is objective? Well, if indeed the, the Occam's razor argument is true and that it happens by just interpreting what the brain's already done in a different way uh, and taking advantage of the fact that the brain did adapt to help our survival so it is in sync with that world that we live in, then because it's using neural circuits which are there in the first place to deal with the physical world and objects that we and every other species has, then of course it's going to feel real because those neuronal patterns are happening at the most fundamental level because they are happening about the world around us. That's what it was there for in the first place. It was mediating signals from the world. So the sensation is always going to be that it's objective. And I'm going to show this picture because this actually this picture is really the key to the whole thesis. And it's about and it's it's looking at the metaphor map that Lakoff and Nunez were really talking about. What are we doing? We've got a familiar domain and a new domain. What's actually going on? Are we taking all of the processing that we know about and applying it here, or are we pulling back there to that way? And I've just used, for, for, since, since I know there was going to be a bunch of mathematicians types in the audience, I've just written that down in, in familiar mathematical language to show are we pushing out or are we pulling back. Okay. You can't do that in PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> okay. Steve was not bad, actually. Okay. Um, this, by the way, has a corollary. This is why I, I mentioned earlier, when I do mathematics, boy, do I, does it feel real. It feels like discovery of a world that's waiting to be discovered. And I think there's an explanation for that. And it's the explanation essentially, which it's just putting a nuance on what I've already said. The Occam's razor argument says the brain hasn't learned to do a bunch of new tricks. It's learned to package the old tricks so that it pleases the owner. You, know, you, you haven't learned anything new. You've just learned to make do with what you already have. Remember, I grew up in post-war England. So my childhood was making do with what we had, uh, not having anything new. You guys that grew up in America, you had everything, right? That was what we saw on the TV. Uh, and so you, would, you were building a new world, but we, were, we Europeans had to make do with what we had. Um, so I'm probably prejudiced to think about things in this way. Okay. Um, we, we take the, 
existing stuff and we are resourceful, consciously or unconsciously, and in many cases unconsciously, at using it in a new domain. Mathematics is abstracted from the world. What we do is we construct these abstract skeletal models. We reduce everything to simplistic things. You know, a mathematician can look at this room and see straight lines and right angles and rectangles and squares and circles and spheres and all kinds of other stuff. None of which are actually there. They're creations of my mind that correspond to things in the world. Uh, and it's a powerful way of talking about it, at least with people that have the same sensory apparatus as we do. Um, but that tower of metaphors that gives us mathematics, and I di I, I, although I disagree with Lakoff and Nunez in the details, I don't disagree with the principles behind what they're doing. Since that grounds you right back to your brain acquiring its knowledge of the world in the physical world, then you're using apparatus that links directly to the world. So of course it's going to feel platonic because the brain always was working by thinking it was dealing with the real world. If it didn't, it wouldn't have been a survival mechanism. The point was there was a real saber, there was a saber-toothed tiger there and you had to respond to that real saber-toothed tiger. It wasn't a fiction. If you thought it was a fiction, you're dead and your gene pool, your genes are not going to get into the pool. So it, it, it really did ground out in, in, in fundamental ways in the physical world. And so uh, the fact that mathematics feels platonic is just a simple corollary of the fact that it's done by a brain that evolved to mediate stimuli and responses in the physical world. Okay, so let's just summarize that one. What do we mean by, remember we're talking about intelligent life, right? And trying to make contact with intelligent life, which by the way, I'm all for. I think this is cool. I thought this, I, I was great to get an invitation here. I think this is really cool stuff, right? Um, so I'm just being the devil's advocate here. Um, actually, I believe what I'm saying, but I'm still have been a devil's advocate. Um, what do we mean by intelligent behavior? Well, intelligent is essentially in the eyes of the person, right? It, it's, it's, be, it's behavior that uh, makes rational sense in, in advancing our goals and purposes and survival and so forth. Okay. Um, and, and this is essentially, this, this is life 101, right? You get stimuli and, and you get responses and creatures are alive that can respond in, in increasingly sophisticated ways to the, to the stimulus. And then you have these things that are in the middle uh, that, that mediate between the stimuli and the output. And then the more sophisticated that mediation is, the more we would regard it as intelligent. So, for example, uh, you can get stimuli and output. Sunflowers respond to stimuli. They just follow the sun. Okay. Well, it seems as though they follow the Tour de France, but that, I think, is, a, is, is, is getting the cart, cart before the horse. Um, okay. And there are these sort of uh, water-based bacteria that swim towards nutrients and so forth and, and, and away from poisonous things. And there's no neurons, there's nothing like a brain, there's just sort of chemistry going on here. Um, and then you've got various kinds of other creatures uh, with some interesting behaviours, but again, no brain, it's just stimuli responses. Um, but then you get to sort of simple brains where there's just stuff going on, but not necessarily uh, complex things. Um, I mean, actually, I've got, I mean, I've made a big jump. I've gone to brains that are recognizable as brains, uh, but brains where you can recognize predators and, uh, and so forth. And then you get these th even more sophisticated looking things uh, where you've got mediation going on. And then you get to the high level brains where uh, fairly complex mediation going on between the stimulus and the response. And then you get to um, humans and human experts. You know, when you go to a doctor, what you're doing is you're going to someone who's got very finely tuned abilities to recognize different categories of danger and safety and so forth. It's all about type recognition and how many types you can recognize. At the most basic level, a brain recognizing two types, dangerous and advantageous. And then it gets more and more complex. And as the brains develop, they can make finer and finer distinctions. And we can model all of this in computer systems. This is all sort of fairly uh, well understood and known. Okay, so it's about type recognition. 
not computation, it's about type recognition, responding in a more advantageous way to a particular type of input with a particular type of output and mediating uh, that input output stimulus response mechanism. Okay. So let's forget the idea that the brain is a computer. You know, I mean, people used to think it was a telephone exchange, and then they thought it's all sorts of other things, right? It's, uh, you know, well, yeah, it's sort of like a telephone exchange. In some ways, it's sort of like a computer. But you know, there's been this history of thinking of the brain in terms of the latest, sexiest technology in science. Um, <coughs> okay, so let's forget that and let's think about what brains are in terms of all of the creatures that have brains, of different kind of degrees of complexity. Uh, they developed to mediate responses of the physical world to physical responses. Okay. So, then there's a big question. Certainly our brain can do an awful lot of thinking without physical stimulus and responses. We can just, in fact, you know, a mathematician is someone who gets paid to lay down, close their eyes and work. That's the story we tell anyway. And uh, So long as we can produce papers, people have to believe us. <laughs> but thinking takes place, you know, abstract thinking is something that happens inside the brain without the need for stimulus and response. So here's the story. We have this brain that developed to mediate stimuli from responses. Sometimes there's a, an automatic response, but m m we, we behave intelligently, we stay out of a lot of difficulty by taking the input stimulus, reflecting on it, running a model of the world. What happens if I do this? What will happen if I do that? We simulate very rapidly, and mostly subconsciously, various outcomes that could happen, and then we, we, we arrive at, a, at a, a solution or a conclusion. So we've got mediation, and what's going on is a sort of a what-if modelling of the world. If I do this, that, if I do that, and it happens very quickly, and we come to a, to a certain conclusion. How did the brain, and we know we can do that because we do it all the time. We do it explicitly now. You know, we sit around and we brainstorm, we think about mathematics. We explicitly run these models of the world, these, these, these simulations of the world all the time about what the outputs would be for the various inputs. Again, using Occam's razor, what's the most efficient way of thinking offline? Because abstraction, abstract mathematical thinking, it's one of the things that arises when you think about the world offline. By the way, the same argument gives you language. In fact, that one of the big clues I had when I was doing my work on the math gene was work that had been done in the evolution of language capacity. And our language capacity, we think, is at least 75,000 years old, maybe even 300,000 years old. It's, it's a little bit... 300,000 is probably a little bit long, but it could be as recently as 75,000 years when our ancestors got... Uh, language with a grammatical structure, recursion and, and, grammat and, and, and uh, a recursive grammar that allows you to put together sentences and, and complex thoughts. So <coughs> grammar is what you get, the grammar of language is what you get when you model the world in terms of relationships and things in a sort of non-logical, non-quantitative way. And mathematics is what you get when you model the world in terms of the sort of mathematical type concepts. So the, the argument that I gave for the origins of mathematical capacity are actually the same arguments for the origins of linguistic capacity. Okay. Um, and I, so I just I built my thesis on the back of other work, about work from others on the origins of, of language. Okay, so the, the, the question then is, what's the simplest mechanism whereby you can get this? And we're talking complexity now, that this, this organ can think about these new things? Well, the simplest explanation is the brain sends out a signal that simulates, the, the easiest thing to simulate is the potential input stimulus. This thing evolved to do with an input stimulus. So a certain pattern of neuronal activity that came from the senses got this brain doing stuff. Now, two things you could do. Either the brain learns how to stimulate that particular pattern of neuron, neuronal activity that gets the brains doing the same way, or the brain learns a whole new bunch of tricks to think about a different domain. Well, Occam's razor says the simplest thing is you're simulating the input, putting, it, putting that brain in a situation that, in a sense, it's been in many times in its ancestral history with things in the real world, and then 
you're running old age circuits. So you're taking a thing that's become very complicated to aid our survival, and you're running those circuits with different kinds of objects. And you're doing it by changing the input mechanism to just get that brain doing that stuff that it's done. So it's a complex organ. We can either just change the input, let it run, or we can just retrain that brain to do stuff that it hasn't done before. Again, Occam's razor, which I keep using a lot, uh, tells us that that's the simplest explanation. Well, that's where mathematics takes place. So the argument would be that when we do mathematics, we're basically setting the brain up so that when it does its thing that it evolved to do for very basic survival things over, ev over, over hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, it's just doing those things and we get mathematical results out of it. Just as we can get mathematical results out of a computer because we created it so that when it does its thing, it means something to us. And the corollary I already mentioned, this is why it feels real. Because the brain is doing the stuff it did within the real world. In other words, the brain never does learn to deal with abstract numbers. It learns how to deal with counters and counting collections of real objects. And so my brain, when I think about the number nine, stuff's happening that really corresponds to lots of experience with nine objects. And then we expand and we generalize and so forth. So it gets grounded out in experience. Okay. Which means that this itself is the universe that mathematics is telling us about. It's telling us about the human brain and how the human brain deals with the world and what's going on uh, when it switches off the input mechanisms, stops producing the output responses, and just runs models. So this tells us about the physical world only to the degree that it's remained in sync with the physical world. In the case of humans talking to each other, hey, no problem. We've all got essentially similar backgrounds. We're built the same way. We've got the same sensory apparatus. We have the same <laughs> histories. It's going to work for us. My number seven is going to be your number seven. It's going to be everybody's number seven. <laughs> Which reminds me, I haven't switched mine off, but <laughs> fortunately no one's called me yet. Um, I, I meant to switch it off before, then I forgot. OK, so we've got the. Uh, it's going to work for humans because there's so much in the similar and we are in sync with our environment that it's going to work for us. It'll also allow us to communicate in very simple ways with, with certain other creatures that, that have similar backgrounds and similar sensory operators. So providing we're talking about creatures with similar sensory apparatus, similar cognitive structure, similar experiences in the world, that mathematics is going to work. If I go to a remote part of the world where they don't speak, well, in fact, I, I've been to parts of the world where I've got no linguistics, in, no language in common, but we can still sit down and I've sat down and done mathematics with other people. That works because the synchronization is right. So in terms of contacting AT, it's going to work providing we're contacting intelligences that have similar backgrounds, similar sensory apparatus, and have dealt with similar issues which actually may be the only ones we want to deal with anyway, um, because I'm not sure what it would mean to deal with something else. But the question is, what else might classify as intelligence? And I have no idea um, what else might classify as intelligence. But this is the world that mathematics tells us about. We're in the matrix, and there's no way out of the matrix. And if that other intelligence isn't in our matrix and doesn't have a similar matrix, we ain't going to be able to do anything with them. And we're not going to we may recognize that there is a signal. Even that, I think, is dubious. But even if we do, there's no reason to assume it's going to be prime numbers. It could be something very different that makes no sense to us. OK. End of story. Thank you. <laughs> Keith, can I? Um uh, you mentioned a couple of times that you didn't agree with uh, Lakoff and yeah. Nunez when it came to functions and abstract yeah. thinking. Um, what is it that, that uh, you didn't agree with? And um, Okay, I, I think they, they iterated the, s the metaphor model too simplistically in that it was you map the all to the new. To me, when you reach, first of all, when you reach calculus, 
you're dealing with things that our evolutionary history gave us no experience. You're dealing with infinitesimals and infinitely large, infinitely small. You're dealing with fictions, which turn out to be useful because of synchronization. But I think at, at a certain level, and it actually happens when you meet 19th century definition of the function, when you start doing abstract functions and things to do with, and then you interpret the calculus uh, in, in terms of abstract functions and so forth, what you're doing then is much more like playing chess than anything else. Now, playing chess doesn't embed itself in evolutionary history. How do you learn to play chess? You learn the rules, you practice the rules. At first, it makes no sense. You're following the rules slavishly. But after you've played enough games of chess, a world creates in your mind, and it all makes holistic sense, and it becomes part of your existence, and, and you think about it, and you describe it in terms of metaphors. But you didn't learn to play chess by interpreting chess in terms of things you did in the playground at all. You simply learnt rules. We are able to learn a domain by learning a bunch of abstract rules, practicing them, take advantage of the fact that the human brain is adaptive, and eventually it seems real. When you talk to a, I mean, I never got to be good at chess. To me, when I talk about chess, it really does sound mechanical. But when I talk, but, uh, but I, I listen to a grandmaster talking about chess, they talk in terms of threats and this, and they talk in all of these meaningful metaphors. For them, it's become very real, but it wasn't arrived at by hierarchy of, of metaphors. It was bootstrapping. So there's, metaphors is a good way of looking at it, but there's something else you can do as a human. You can bootstrap a new idea by writing down rules, and we can learn a rule-based system. So things, abstract mathematics, uh, things like calculus, that's essentially a rule-based system that you learn by following the rules slavishly, and after you've followed the rules long enough, the human brain is, is a great pattern recognizer, synthesizes it and makes sense of it. But it's no longer a hierarchy of, of metaphors. It's a bootstrapping. So there's a discontinuity, and you've bootstrapped. Now, you can interpret the bootstrapping itself in terms of using metaphors, but it's a it's in, in, in terms of detail, it's different. So when I what I said was, I agree with their general thesis, but not in terms of the details, because it's, it's not the same hierarchy of metaphors it's using a bootstrapping technique that the human brain is able to use. Which has implications for education, of course, but it, it means you have to teach college universe, you have to teach college mathematics different from, from K through eight mathematics. And if I can uh, just ask one more yeah. suggestive question or a provocative question. What do you say to the uh, physicists, the quantum, quantum mechanics physicists who, who, who would say you know, that their uh, understanding of mathematics matches what they find with experiment and, and so you know, somehow they're looking into the eye of God or the mind of God when they're dealing with mathematics. O obviously you take a different approach to yeah, that. I think, I've already, I think I've already answered that one in fact. Yeah, it, right. it, it, you, we're, we're locked in Plato's cave and we can only construct it from the shadows on the wall and uh, there's no way out of that. We're, we're literally inside that. You know, it's actually impossible to prove to anybody else. And it, I mean, solipsism is hard to escape from. I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I actually am not a solipsist, <laughs> but it would have been pointless me coming here if I was. But, uh, but on the other hand, maybe I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe I'm in bed asleep. So, I mean, I have two um, yeah. things on prime numbers. One thing is that, um, I mean, the Mayans, who had a very advanced mathematical system, as far as I know, never really, at least nothing that they've left us, seems to deal with prime numbers. I mean, it may have been just something that the ancient Greeks were fascinated by, and, every, yeah. and our mathematical tradition goes back to them, and so that's why we think of prime numbers as being this fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, certainly other, even human independent math mathematical systems that have been developed don't seem to find this. On the other hand, prime numbers seem very grounded in counting, yeah. you know, because, um, you know, because, you know, counting gives you addition and subtraction, and addition and subtraction gives you multiplication and division, and prime numbers fall out of that. So, you know, it does, I mean, I could, by that a, a completely different alien, I mean, even a maybe even a completely different human culture, but e especially an alien could come up with a, you know, as they get above mere counting and addition and subtraction and into calculus that they start 
wildly diverging from us, even if they're like the results are the same, it, it seems um, it, it still prime numbers seem like everybody has to agree on one plus one equals two, and from there you get the prime numbers. Well, yeah, everybody that's sort of like us has to agree with that. But I've well, everybody yeah. counts yeah. has yeah. to. Yeah. Well, that, that would include, seem to include any intelligent life. As it's oh, described. I don't like that last bit. I mean, I agreed with you everything up to the <laughs> point you said any intelligent life. I mean, um, any in, in, what? does intelligent <laughs> life, does it have to be, does it have to involve discretization? To us, intelligent life means categorization and discretization. And maybe that's our definition of intelligence, that you can, look, you can take inputs and you can discretize them and categorize them. That's a perfectly reasonable definition of intelligence. And that puts them very similar to, I mean, that probably does put them in the area where mathematics is going to work and prime numbers. But I don't see that intelligence per se has to involve discrete categorization. Can I think of anything else? No. But so what? <laughs> I'm just not that smart, right? And none of us are. We're just doing our best. Yeah. Okay. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to be, you know. Look, I'm trying to think of a good example yeah. here. I understand your point. Our yeah. brain models, and we think the real world. Yeah. So at one level, I think, okay, I can see color. Let's say there's an alien species that's total black and white. And then those old color charts you see where they have the number embedded to see if you can only see black and white you know, for the kids. So I could understand if we use color in communication and they're only black and white and they didn't have a concept, I could see that, that in their model of the universe there's no color, we have it, so there's yeah. no communication. I, I would use that as an example I was thinking of. But my problem is at this very end you had this giant leap. So if there's a creature like that that doesn't use math, we probably won't communicate with them. But if we are getting a signal, they've built a radio telescope, and maybe oh. this is where I can't make the leap. Oh. Is there a way to build a radio telescope to send and receive without math? Because even if it's different, different signals, uh, there was a previous talk you had here once that uh, showed using almost geometry for addition, subtraction, just to give an example of don't assume you know, we use one plus one, those symbols, and they'll use A plus A. I'm making that up. But So do you have it in your mind, an example where that would work, where th they could create that technology but not have a concept of math as kind of he was referring to, the one plus one equals two? Aren't, and maybe I can't see no, it. Maybe that's no. the problem. You're asking a good question that yeah, no, I my model of the universe just can't break out of it. Maybe tonight I'll, I'll wake up and go, ah, I get him. Yeah, no, so, no, the answer is I don't yeah, have another yeah. model, but I don't think just because I don't have another yeah. model and every other human being doesn't have the model, I don't think that necessarily means there is no other model. So you're leaving this as a student exercise. <laughs> We're all supposed to go home and think about this. That, oh, my God, oh, yeah, that's I mean, homework. I, that, that, that's, that's okay. I used to annoy my teenagers when they were teenagers <laughs> because they would want help with their homework, uh -huh. and I would answer a question with a question. Okay, oh, you're you know. one of those. Okay. <laughs> I'm that kind True of a guy. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> teenagers hate us. I mean, at least I own teenagers. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thanks for an interesting talk. It's a bit of a follow-up on the last question. When I came in the room, I thought there would basically be two ways of contacting ETs of things that we would share. One would be math, yeah. which you've talked about, and the second would be physics. So again, going back, if we get some signal that's using you know, radio or some you know, property of the universe, they have to be able to manipulate that in the same way that we do. So if we share physics, would you apply a similar argument to that we would might not be able to communicate on the basis of a shared physics, like the you know, oh, spectrum of hydrogen atoms or something like that? Physics is what arises when we try to understand the, we, the universe through mathematics. I mean, I've just taken Galileo. I mean, physics is what you get when you look at the universe with a mathematical mind. So it, you include physics with everything I've said. Well, it's a already set of prime numbers that yeah. you send out to the spectrum of the hydrogen. So there's some representation of something mm -hmm. like that. Well, yeah. that is something they will have hydrogen there or some sort of atoms, even though their chemistry and biology and cognition should be completely different. Is that seem something that's a bit more likely to be in common than Yeah, so yeah, if they, if they take that and you encode what you know about it, in it comes back to the fact that you're, the, you're restricting yourself, you're communicating with an intelligence that, it, that is essentially our kind of intelligence. That is, there's enough synchronization between those two kinds of intelligences, uh, which I think is fine. I mean, I, I, I have no problem with saying that mathematics is going to work for anything like that. I just don't make that final leap to say there is no other kind of intelligence. I'm sort of defining yeah, intelligence as. 
and mathematics and physics and what we recognise as intelligence that we can recognise as intelligence, yeah. Um, but I just don't think... That, that I see no reason to assume that there's not another kind of intelligence. I mean... Yeah, I mean yeah. <laughs> If we communicate, that seems like the type of intelligence would have to be an overlap. Because I just can't make that. This has to be an overlap, yeah. There has to be. But you're right. If there's something we discover, we have yeah. an intelligent octopus that has nothing, but we're never in a contact. If we land on their planet, it's fine, but okay, we couldn't contact, talk with them. Yeah, because it depends on the whole history of, of, into, in, of different kinds of input sensations and just responses. Is never we just never ne recognize it. No, it's, it's like, you know, Fred Hoyle's The Black Cloud, yeah. you know. Was, was a, I mean, I guess that's probably part of the thinking that's been, you know, I read that when I was a kid and I thought it was a great book and, you know, the, 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 you just wouldn't recognize it because it's, it's there, but it's, 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 it's communicating at the speed of, yeah. of light. And so it's, it's, an, it's an organism, but it's, it's almost so continuous. <laughs> okay, so yeah. This is actually kind of a follow-up of the <laughs> second question, which was about... I think uh, they're all going to be the same question, <laughs> actually. But yeah. It's about counting ability and your comment yeah. on uh, the whether or not a being uses discretization yeah. in perceiving the world. And I, and I tend to think of discretization as being <coughs> the fallout of trying to model an infinitely complex world in a very confined space and the need to form perceptual primitives that are simple enough to be contained in here. And that would lead to me perceiving lines and circles which look like the same thing, more or less, yeah. and I would so I've discretized them, and I then would imagine that I should start counting them. And as long as we're talking about beings that are finite, like like ourselves, I would think that that would be very likely. And I'm just wondering what you have to say about that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If if we're dealing with beings like us, I think it's extremely likely. You know, but I, I still think <laughs> it, you know, it makes sense to sort of put yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, it, it, it definitely the finiteness is, is, is crucial because you have to take that complexity and reduce it to a small number of things. So, but that's, I mean, in a sense, that's sort of going back to what I'm saying is that's constraining the field. But I, it, you know, it, it's arguably it's the constraint that <coughs> we're all happy with anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm just trying to give a nuance on what Seti's trying to do, that we're trying to see if there are someone, I would just say, are we trying to make contact with intelligent life that is within our scope of what we mean by intelligent Life. Um, I, mean, I can't defend it, right? I mean, I'm just advancing this. <laughs> so my question is a very womanly question. Um, I have friends who do maths just because they love it. There's something about cracking open a book and yeah. going through a formula and getting a right answer that just activates major pleasure centers oh, in the that. brain. Been there. Yeah. So I was going. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was going to ask you. In your book, do you talk about whether you know? Let's say when you solve a mathematical equation. Is there, are there certain chemicals like dopamine and oh other yeah. endorphins that just oh get yeah. released? <laughs> and oh that yeah. has helped us. Oh, to yeah, we're all dopamine way. junkies. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a keen video game player as well for the same reason. I mean, yeah. <laughs> video games do it on a. M in mathematics, the high is a very rare and painfully arrived at. With a video game, you can have them every five seconds. I mean, it's, uh, you, know, you play Bejeweled, and you get that stuff like that. So that's why they've got this addictive capacity. Oh, yeah, no, we're all. We're all on highs in mathematics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. I just wanted to um, make sure I understand the basic concept, maybe yeah. expressed a little differently. Uh, you're saying that our mathematics arose from our adaption to our environment yep. and to our survival in this environment. Are you saying that if we contact an ET from an entirely different environment, that they will have formed an entirely different branch of mathematics to explain their environment and we may never be able to communicate. Oh yeah, yeah, I think that's... Is that a good summary of what... Yeah, you know, that, that, that example I gave about the, the, the Fred Hoyle book, The Black Cloud, where you just know it has to be intelligent, but you've got no way of making any connection with it. So it's, it's an environmental cloud. thing which yeah. could limit our engagement yeah. with other people or other societies. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we get it, we, we get nuances of that just with different species on the planet and different different human beings, but there's so much similarity in being a human being out of evolutionary history that that it works. But um, I mean, uh, simply by again, if you apply Occam's razor once more, um, you wouldn't need to postulate a different kind of intelligence. You could assume all intelligences roughly arise in the same way. 
and therefore we probably are doing the right kind of thing. Um, but I just stop short of saying that I don't buy the fact that that's the only way that something could be classified as intelligent. That's intelligence as we classify intelligence. Yeah. Keith, I'm going to use uh, my third question here. Uh, I hope it'll be my last. It's your fourth. <laughs> oh, fourth, okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'm... So um, that's, that's, that's a Clint Eastwood line, but never mind. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. Uh, there's uh, just uh, on a campus at NASA Ames, there's a Singularity University. Yeah. Those guys are all about the singularity is near, we're going to evolve into robots and so on. Yeah. Is, this, is this a good time for us to cut our bonds to, uh, to our primitive amygdalas and perhaps move to the next, uh, whatever's next in terms of uh, intelligence? And it is that... Um, going to allow us to get to another you know, well, stage okay. of communications with the universe, <laughs> potentially. I mean, if we could cut, our, cut the bonds of our upbringing and our math genes in a sensible way, um, can we make ourselves or our progenitors even more um, uh, prosperous, I guess? Uh, I think we're awfully close to being there. I mean, just look at what happens with the financial markets now that it all happens automatically. Um, the degree of interconnectivity and, and on a global scale means already there's a sense in which all of humanity, at least ev everyone that's on the net, is forming a collective intelligence. And I don't think we, we, that necessarily is a benign thing. I mean, that could be incredibly self-destructive just because of the speed of things happening. Um, because stuff can happen that actually has physical manifestations very quickly because these networks are connected to other stuff. The financial markets are what in one case that we've already seen. So, in a sense, we're already in a world where there is something that arguably is an intelligence, and we're the neurons in that intelligence. And I don't think we, as the neurons, need to assume that that intelligence is going to be to our particular benefit. So, we may be closer to that than, than we would feel comfortable with. And I, I actually find that kind of scary. Uh, but since I can't do anything about it, I promptly forget it and go for a bike ride or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Khan Academy does that already, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but the, yeah, I mean, lots of websites do that. Facebook does that. They, I mean, they just monitor what you're doing all the time. You know, big data is big data, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, continuing with just the terrestrial issues, yeah. uh, one thing, uh, I, I think it was Wigner, Eugene Wigner, who made the, the observation on about the... Uh, remarkable effectiveness of mathematics in representing the physical world. So would, would your answer be to him, s well, so what? They came from the same place? Oh, yeah, I don't think oh. it is remarkable. Uh, uh, okay, you're, you're, or Eugene, you're just looking in a mirror, you know. Yeah, he's and, looking and in the mirror. Marveling yeah. at the fact that, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I don't think it is unreasonable effectiveness. I think it's effective. It's, 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 of course it would be effective because it came out of the brain that evolved to be effective in the universe. So I don't think it is unreasonable. I, I still think it's cool. Uh, but it's, it's, I don't think it's unreasonable. Yeah, I'd like to hear, hear your conversation with an exponent of that other view. <laughs> yeah, coming back to the Earth again, I think one good example might be that we do share the planet with other intelligent beings who live in a different world, namely, say, dolphins and mm -hmm. whales who live in a water world and yeah. uh, are adapted to that and we can't figure out how to communicate with them, yet it's very clear that they have some kind of intelligence that could be as great as ours, but in, that has evolved in a completely different way. Um, I can also envision, you know, a species out there that, or two, two examples. One would be a species that might be similar to us, mm -hmm. but whose mathematics is so evolved that the way they would think the was easiest to communicate would be a branch of mathematics we had never even conceived of yet. Yeah, this know, or a species that whose primary mathematics would be equivalent to our f our concept of fractals, and that their entire 
you know, world and, and explanation of the world was in terms of what we would see as fractals, which was a branch of math that we didn't develop until fairly recently. Yeah. And in fact, you, you can even do that within, within human societies. Um, you know, we're about to, I'm about to say something in terms of you know, anthropological interpretation, which is always a dangerous thing to say. But um, certainly talking to some of the experts in Australia on some of the Aboriginal tribes, there's certainly some groups that have nothing that we would, passing this on, that, that there's nothing that we would regard as explicit mathematics, but incredibly complex linguistic structures for dealing with familial relationships. And when you look at the way they use language to talk about complex relationships between people and to do with space, people and space, the only way you can cash that out is that it's so precise you say that is a mathematics in its own right. It's a mathematics that focuses not on numbers and not on shapes and sizes, but on the network of human relationships. And that they have a mathematics, it's just dealing with a very different domain to the one we do. Um, now that's again, that's interpreting things in different ways, but it's, you, know, it's, it's, you don't have to go to dolphins to find complex thought that's clearly intelligent to the advantage of that particular species of agent, and yet is not what we would call mathematics. And uh, dolphins are interesting because yeah, they, they live in a sort of a, a continuous world, not a discrete one. And yeah, we can't make sense of it, but it could be incredibly intelligent. They might be by any, I don't know, how would you say they were more intelligent than those? Even that is, like, you can't really cash that out, but in any sense we could try and get at it, they might be smarter than we are. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember a book by uh, Quentin Robbins called What is Mathematics? It yeah, goes too. back to yeah. the 1950s or so. I was young at the time. But <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it, yeah. uh, the premise, of course, was to uh, start with axioms and then develop postulates in, yeah. in uh, uh, logic way. So uh, it's based on something. You know, Obviously, what, pos what I axioms you accept at the first sets the primary uh, goals of how this, and obviously in this sense, uh, we could have some other intelligence out there that sets a different set of axioms and develops entirely different mathematics. That, uh, so it, it wouldn't be related at all to what we have if we talked about prime numbers or anything like that. They, they didn't necessarily relate at all. So, uh, but the, the principles of uh, what your assumptions are in <laughs> as you start out um, is could be the same thing, and but we still couldn't communicate by mathematical thought or in, in that sense. But the, uh, it seems to relate to, to what you're saying. In yeah, the although the, the, the axiomatization stuff only becomes essential at this level where I parted company with, with Lakoff and Nunez because at the, the earlier stuff is embodied. Um, now, for sure, it's true that after we've developed a lot of mathematics, we, at the end of the 19th century, and to some extent back in with Euclid even, we started writing down axioms. But by the time we get to formulating the axioms, one of the, one of the assumptions about an axiom of mathematics is it, is it, it appears self-evident or believable. And then you're already well down this path of, of, high, of, 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 of metaphor hierarchy that grounds you in the world world. So it only gets publishable and, by and bought by others if those axioms actually do ground out in our experiences. So you know, if people write to me roughly once a week with their own axioms for the universe. <laughs> I've got a drawer full of these things, um, and I don't know what I'm going to do with this drawer full of these things, although the last time I moved, I threw them out. Um, but they have their own model of the world, um, but it's not everybody else's. And so uh, it might be internally consistent for all I know, but it doesn't make any sense to me, and so it doesn't get accepted. But what does get accepted is stuff that actually grounds out in the real world. You know, if, you're, if, if your model does not have two plus two equals four, it's not for me, unless you're a computer scientist, and that's, that's different. Uh, you know, two plus two is zero, actually. Well, it depends on the size of the, 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 the storage. But, uh, yeah. um, I think this is really significant for the way math is taught, because I think that the big problem with math instruction is that mathematicians are hallucinating, and they're looking in the mirror all the time, and the students don't know what they're looking at. So once you understand <laughs> math, <laughs> yeah, once you understand math, you see it right there in front of you. Yeah. It's on the board. Why, why can't you see it? I, d I drew the symbol there. It's, it's obvious. Whereas the student, it's, um, you know, it's not there. Yeah. So if this could be incorporated into math instruction so that people would expect to go through a hallucination you know, yeah. transition, that would really help. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, yeah, no, 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 you know, 
why did I become a mathematician? Because I bought into this axiomatic stuff. I thought it was really cool, this really neat stuff. Um, and it was much more simpler than anything else. Right? I mean, you know, I discovered at high school that mathematics was the simplest of the sciences and everything, everything else was complicated. Mathematics was beautifully simple because you just had five rules and if it didn't fall from the rules, you didn't do it. But most people don't see it that way. Uh, and it doesn't make sense, it's just arbitrary rules. So, you know, I, I, and, you know, I got pushed along this, thir this thir I mean, this is just a sort of a dressing up a bit, but I got pushed along these, these general thoughts in large part by, by thinking of the educational role and uh, the outreach. I do a lot of outreach work. I write for the general audiences and general public, and I'm constantly looking for metaphors that people can understand uh, mathematics in terms of. And after looking for lots and lots of metaphors, uh, it's all about grounding it in their everyday experience. So it was educational considerations that pushed me along these thought processes in the first place. Uh, I was just going to uh, make a point that to a large extent, our external world is sort of quantifiable, but there is sort of an internal world of our thoughts and consciousness, which so far hasn't really, re it has resisted quantification to a certain extent. And uh, it wouldn't help perhaps with the radio telescope, but it is possible hypothetically that there is something influencing our thoughts and that conscious thought may be a rectification or a recognition of a signal in some sort of waves that we aren't even conscious of. Uh. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and then no comment because, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you, you've taken my approach and taken it one level higher, and you've asked me a question I can't possibly answer either. Yeah. So you're into the spirit of the thing, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, Keith, thank you so much for coming okay. and giving us a talk. Um, I think that we'd have to say that everyone who works actively yeah. in the field of SETI yeah. is guilty as charged. Um, for us, intelligence. Uh, a pragmatic definition is the ability to um, build and operate a transmitter yeah. because that's what we have some yeah. chance of, of finding. And I don't necessarily think that that's too awful a limitation because yeah. although there could be other types of intelligence, I think either intelligence is singular and we're it, or there are many of w among which there are other examples of transmitter builders. Yeah. And yeah. the others we can't find, but why don't we go looking for those that we might? Yeah. No, and absolutely, that's why I said it. I, I think it's really cool to be invited here. I'd love to be invited here. I think you guys are doing really great stuff. You know, I, I was inspired by the movie, and I was inspired by the whole idea. Um, so, absolutely, yeah. Last question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I was actually thinking of the transmitter question and my first thought was that has to require this mathematical thinking and that would sort of lead to these general principles and but the alternative might be um, you know you have evolution that has created some of the most fantastic machines ever built transduces yeah. visible light produces visible light sound who knows maybe we uh, through process like that you end up with little creatures that have parabolic discs and a dolphin-like communication system that makes it useful to have those, and yet never has uh, cognitively designed their way to that, right? Yeah. The way evolution gets there. So there's some kind of the alternative in a way, yeah. you know, and. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, yeah. A, it's the black cloud again. It's all of this yeah. stuff that just sort of somehow comes together and it's, it's, it's communicating, and so it doesn't need a transmitter. It is a transmitter, mm -hmm. and it just moves through. I mean, I still think that's a really cool book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so. Keith, uh, we have a uh, special Are We Alone mug uh, that will hopefully remind you uh, that you were here and uh, you weren't <laughs> in bed <laughs> uh, when you get up in the morning. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Keith through his great talk. Okay. Appreciate it.